And thanks for joining us. Chiefs uh, of uh, military and defense uh, amongst the uh, member states say they are ready for a military action in Niger with the aim of restoring a democratic order uh, in the Republic of Niger. Uh, Ghana's Defense Minister Dominic Nitiul spoke at a meeting of chiefs uh, here in Accra this morning and indicated that Ghana is ready to commit troops to ECOWAS should all efforts uh, to negotiate with the military junta fail. The security chiefs uh, from 11 countries are currently meeting at Burma Camp in Accra to draw up a deployment plan following last month's coup in Niger, which toppled the government of President Mohamed Basu. Uh, we have an exclusive interview with the ECOWAS Commissioner uh, for Political Affairs and Peace as well as Security, Ambassador Abdel Fattah uh, Musa, for you shortly. First, though, uh, Ghana's Minister of Defense, Dominic Niti, will speaking a while ago. If presidential guards in Guinea and Niger, I will use the word take hostage their president, nobody, and let me repeat, nobody in West Africa is safe. That is why I urge you to continue to be loyal to your heads of states. I urge you to continue to be loyal to ECOWAS directives and to give effect that the days that coup d'etat enjoy the support of our people are over. Yes, in democracy, people will agree to disagree. But the vast majority of our people, you, the vast majority of our people in West Africa, do not want to be under the difficulties that we are facing today. You have the right, as men in uniform, to ask your governments for what you will need to be able to defend your nations. You have the right to ask your governments to give you the tools to defend the territorial integrities of your nations to ensure that your nations remain peaceful. You have the right to ensure that your people choose your leaders in a free and fair manner. But the world will disagree. ECOWAS will disagree. The people of ECOWAS will disagree. When you choose, or people under you choose, to take hostage the people that your constitution gives power to. Uh, the Defence Minister indicating the position of the Republic of Ghana a while ago at uh, Burma camp. But um, what's the next move for ECOWAS, knowing that it is going to activate the standby force? I've been speaking to ECOWAS Commissioner for uh, Political Affairs, Peace and Security, Ambassador Abdel Fatal Musa. The first uh, phase of the engagement uh, have, have actually uh, wrapped up here uh, at Burma camp and uh, we know that of course the essence of the meeting today is to have all of the military chiefs, all of the chiefs of defense from West African countries uh, converge here to d discuss the decision uh, which is borders on the deployment of a military uh, troop into the Republic of Niger. The, the whole idea is to ensure that there is the reinstatement of President Mohamed Basum and also constitutional order is restored um, to the Republic of Niger. And the background to it is that uh, the Republic of Niger experienced a coup d'etat at the end, just at the tail end of last month, uh, a reason for which uh, we have uh, all of these meetings happening. Now, the last meeting or summit of the ECOWAS leaders uh, actually happened in Abuja. Now, after that meeting, the heads of states actually decided uh, to operationalize, or if, if we could use that word, 
activate an ECOWAS standby force. That, that was the basic decision of the leaders of the West Africa Cyber Region. Subsequent to that, uh, we know that ECOWAS formed a committee of chiefs of defense staff who will now look at the operational methods that will be used by the Cyber Regional body in terms of the deployment methods, what should be done, and how that can be approached from a technical point of view. It's the reason for which we are at Burma Camp today. Uh, you, we saw the likes of the Defence Minister, Dominic Nitiwo. Uh, we had uh, the Chief of Defence Staff for the Committee of West African States, uh, the uh, Chief of Defence Staff for the Republic of Nigeria, joining uh, the meeting which, which, which is underway here at uh, Burma Camp General Body ECOWAS. There's also the bigger question about the UN Security Council decision as to whether or not the SAB region has any form of backing from, from the UN um, Security Council. That question came up and the simple response from the sub-regional body ECOWAS is that, look, we don't need the uh, you know decision or tacit approval or express permission from the United Nations Security Council. All we need is to ensure, first of all, uh, that we deploy and i'm speaking from the position of the economic community of west african states when the deployment is done whatever briefing that needs to be given to the u.n about the situation and why the west african leaders are going in will be furnished to the united nations however being a group of sovereign countries there's absolutely no need for any form of deployment so we'll be getting to ambassador uh, fatel shortly just to get some um, briefing on what the next steps are what the way is and how we can actually deal uh, with the situation now and and what the meeting entails for today because that's crucial after today we know that the uh, chiefs of defense staff will round off their meeting tomorrow and will communicate to the world what the next line of action will be there's a question about the republic of ghana as well and what the republic of ghana will do in terms of our position are we committing our troops are we contributing troops are we going to deploy uh, our forces to be part of this uh, sub-regional body knowing that countries such as cape Verde, cape Verde, for instance opted out and did not attend the meeting for today. So it's the reason for which uh, all of these discussions are going right here, going on right here at the uh, Burma Hall uh, at the military headquarters where, we, of course, we're, we're coming to you live from. Uh, let's uh, try and engage Ambassador um, Musa Fatal. Uh, we'll be engaging him shortly. He'll just uh, walk into the shots, obviously, because of uh, the situation we have uh, in, in the day. We know uh, that, obviously, there's a need for us to get a, a brief word from him. So Ambassador uh, Musa will, will join us shortly uh, for us to get a, a brief word from him. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for joining us on the Journey Channel. You could just uh, come closer so yeah. we, we have a word. We know that uh, the security chiefs, you're having your meeting today. Yeah. Uh, first of all, your impression about the engagements that, that, that have transpired in the first hour of the meeting? Oh, the, 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 the this the meeting. meeting yes. I mean, you could see determination. You could see unity of purpose among our uh, military chiefs. Yeah, the chiefs of defense staff, all very determined, you know, and they are just putting the final touches to their operational plans and then get our troops ready. This is more or less a bit like a, a pledging, uh, what is the meeting, because the concept of operation is already ready, it's ready. Uh, all the factors have been taken into account what are the potential obstacles how to overcome them all these were taken into account in the planning session right, right. so this meeting is just to you know refine uh, what we have while preparing for possible intervention and uh, my interaction with the chiefs of defense staff of course of all the members that are here you know what that they are all determined you know determined to go determined and the question is when the, not when I'm not going to tell you because that's a that's no I'm not because that's an operational secret. When you tell them we are going to start marching tomorrow, mm -hmm. then you give them uh, advance notice, you know, to defend. You know, so we know when uh, the military could go in, uh -huh. and up till now, there are diplomatic overtures from ECOWAS, from other uh, what is it? Um, uh, willing partners and others we are giving diplomacy maximum opportunity you know to succeed what we are saying is that if that fails there is this other option 
you know, and this is what we are doing, and we are not letting off, uh, despite the fake news and then the misinformation. And I believe the fake news you're talking about is the fact that you do not have African Union support and the support from uh, the United Nations, correct? That is all, uh, with African Union, that is also fake news. Has anybody read the communique of the African Union Peace and Security Council? I was there, participated. You know, in it, what you are hearing, yeah, of course, when you have a situation like this, you are going to have different opinions. What matters is what comes out of the communique. So everybody should wait for the communique. And then you realize that uh, the African Union Peace and Security Council supports all the measures being taken by uh, ECOWAS to restore constitutional order. They've condemned it and many of them are even calling for the suspension of Niger. Ambassador Fato, are you mindful of the possible implication for the Saab region? Mali, Burkina Faso have said that they would, you know, support the Nigerian junta mm -hmm. if you decide to go in. Are you mindful that of a possibility of a full-blown war? We are very mindful of that. And in the planning phase, all these factors were taken into account. I can tell you confidently, you know, that uh, these uh, ECOWAS standby for troops are ready to take on all comers. This is what I will tell you. And that uh, the threats or whatever by Burkina Faso, Mali, have all been taken on board. Yeah. And... Uh, Why not dialogue? Dialogue? Yeah. The dialogue... Uh, who is closing the door? Probably, I, well, it, it could it be ECOWAS. No, no, it is them. Uh, listen, just a few days back, we were planning ECOWAS AU UN mission to go and meet them. They shut the door on us, saying they are not ready to receive the mission. You're setting about that report? Which one? That, that they shut their doors, because the word you used in your communique was that you were repelled. Th those, the mission was repelled. Exactly. Is that the true account of what that, you That's the true account. We were going, mm -hmm. and they said they were not ready to receive were, were you us. Part of this mission? I was. I was part of it. Secondly, before even then, yeah. uh, the chair of the Equus Authority, mm -hmm. President uh, Ahmed Bola Tinubu of Nigeria, also dispatched the former head of state, General Abdul Salam Abu Bakar, with the Sultan of Sokoto to go also and talk to them. They confined them to the airport. They confined them to the airport. They didn't allow them citing so-called explosive security situation in town, which is all false. All right. So, so we have been extending the hand of dialogue. You know, to them, they are rejecting it. Okay. Recently, they've said they are ready to talk. They say they are ready to talk, and then the next day, they charge President Bazoum, who has been under their uh, what is it? Uh, uh, yeah, confinement as a hostage, charging him with a high treason. You know, and yeah, somebody that uh, you, you've arrested, kept, uh, you know, in detention for how many weeks, it's now that you are finding high treason against him. You know, so these guys are making up, you know, uh, justifications for their coup as they go along. And they will soon run out of excuses. You know, so that is it. So we have not shut the door to dialogue. Well, ECOWAS is ready to dialogue, yeah, but also we are not going to have an elastic Okay, dialogue. I'll ask you shortly about the criticisms that you're being used, quote and unquote, by some other external forces. But the, the fear is that you're radicalizing this military uh, team, mm -hmm. the fact that the life of President Mohamed uh, Bazoum and his family is at risk. The, the more you radicalize them, yeah. anything else could happen. Well, uh, we have said we are going to hold the janta responsible if anything anything untoward happens to uh, to undermine the physical integrity the security the safety of mame bazoum and his family they will pay dearly and dearly here means uh, uh, well uh, i'm not going to spell out you how they are uh, yes I'm, I'm not going to spell out what what will happen to them but what i'm telling you is that there is a lot of fake news you know around right uh this is like equas is being used did the uh, france uh, or the u.s or anybody uh script our protocols for us well, well the reason why some have that perception is because just yesterday were um 
interacting with our partners at DW. The indication is that, for instance, the German uh, Minister for Development yes. and Cooperation will be in Abuja. Uh, yes. She is chairing the Sahel Committee, which obviously has some French elements in there. Concerns about yeah. how we are making the Sahel region now a playground for a proxy war yes. between, you know, the the, the superpowers. Yes. Do we have the capacity uh, to go in fully? We have the capacity to go in. That's number one. Yeah. Number two, what baffles me yeah. is that those who are talking about uh, what is it? Equa uh, uh, being teleguided by the West are those who are also promoting Russia. Okay, in the same, the same people are those who see Russians as saviors. So when will Africa find saviors among themselves instead of always looking for external partners, either the uh, China, uh, America, uh, Russia, and other? When are we going to uh, project our own agency? That's the problem. You know, since the 1960s, right? Africa has always been an arena for proxy wars. First between the Soviet Union, China on one side, and then the West. And today, we are in a multipolar environment, and we are running around from the frying pan to the fire. Uh, leave the Americans, leave the French, uh, now the Russians are the saviors. The, the, the Chinese are the saviors. The Turks are the saviors. We have got all these forces in the region. Uh, all those who have Africa at heart, right should try to generate internal resistance to all these and not to oppose one and then be welcoming the other on the other not receiving funds from the west from the french or we are not receiving nothing zero we are not receiving anything the heads of state have said we are going into uh, niger if need be with our own resources finally uh, the un security council um <laughs> you know uh, backing is very necessary for you knowing that you know the world is also watching what's happening do you do you feel that that you've you flouted that protocol the need to you know okay. ensure that yeah. you work together with the united nations when was the when did the security council last have unanimity maybe because of the among, geopolitics so you may not have because of geopolitics so it is obvious that uh, even if you are going to talk about climate change there will be a p5 member who will veto it much less this situation multilateralism is dead we are in a world of multipolarity the security council will never be unanimous and you just need the veto of one of the five powers okay permanent members and then it is dead why waste your time we have received the support of the United Nations Secretary. The Secretary General has severally backed what Ekoas is doing. He has called for the release of Bazoum. He has condemned his detention and all that. For us, that is more than enough. Okay. So finally, what message do you have for the people of Ghana, some who are anxious that the, the, the region may be destabilized? Yeah. Uh, look, fellow Ghanaians, I am a Ghanaian myself, yeah. right? <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so this is it. You see, uh, we are talking about... Uh, if we don't go in, if they refuse dialogue, what I would say to fellow Ghanaians is that the situation there will be worse than it is currently. There are already internal fishes that we are picking up. Okay, a, a country like Niger that re, uh, sort of managed their diversity very well in the past, particularly the Tuaregs question. Today, they are saying that we, the Tuaregs and the Arab, yeah, the majority who are the Hausa, the Kanuri, the Jerma, are now uh, denying us the ability also to contribute to nation building through leadership. And already there are past guerrilla leaders okay uh, who are mobilizing against this janta you know so not ev not everything is uh, okay even within the country forget about what we hear there isn't that unity and the thing is that those who are fearing uh, the, the consequences of a possible military intervention should exert pressure on the junta to go for the peaceful option. Uh, Equus has not closed that door. This is what I repeat all the time. We haven't closed the door, but people c concentrate all their comments on the military option. They are not talking about all the other options that are on the table. 
Okay, so this is this is what I'll We're tell grateful. You. Definitely the meeting will wrap up tomorrow. Okay. Grateful for your okay. time. Thank yeah. you uh, for joining us. And that's uh, Ambassador uh, Fasal Musa, who's the uh, Commissioner for the uh, ECOWAS. Uh, the, that's uh, the, the Secretariat the, in charge of um, you know political affairs uh, at ECOWAS. And it's the, our way of wrapping up here uh, from the military headquarters, Burma Camp, where that meeting is still underway. We're hoping that by the end of tomorrow, there'll be consensus and we'll hear collectively uh, from the Committee of Chiefs of Defense that who would wrap up and communicate to West Africa uh, the modus operandi of that ECOWAS standby force that will be uh, restoring constitutional order in Asia. Bless us again. Reporting for Joy News, Bemakam, Accra. Okay, uh, right after that, here I am in the studio and uh, doing more analysis on uh, the meeting which transpired today. So far, there's been uh, opposition to the planned military action uh, with the Christian Council, for instance, in Ghana and other civil society groups pushing for diplomatic efforts. But the big question is, and which we're seeking some answers today to, is that should ECOWAS proceed to intervene uh, when it comes to the political situation in Niger? Well, we've been asking some of our viewers uh, on social media. So let's get to uh, social media and get uh, some of the um, feelings and sentiments that we have uh, on there. And we've been doing that, for instance, on X, right? No more tweet, Twitter. So it's, uh, it's X now. Right, so we're asking the question, should Ghana contribute um, troops to the ECOWAS standby force to Niger? That's the question we're asking. So, uh, for instance, you have um, an option if you feel you are indifferent. So that's where we stand, for instance. Um, we, we're standing, uh, you know, in the middle. For instance, we're giving that option that we're indifferent about it. But if you take a look at uh, the views that we have so far, and we started this just um, some few uh, hours ago, uh, minutes in fact, upon coming uh, on air, you would realize that there's uh, this whole wave of uh, resentment against the decision to deploy the troops into Niger. Uh, that's because, just take a look at it, 11.2% say, well, you can go ahead and intervene when it comes to the situation in Niger. And a significant population of, uh, of about 82.5% are saying no. We don't agree with that option. Uh, quite a few also uh, are in the middle, just like we are, being indifferent about the situation, uh, amounting to some 6.3% of the population, which believes that, um, well, whatever the decision may be, whatever uh, the outcome may be, uh, the feeling is that you could go, you, you could also stay where you are. But it's quite clear, a stark difference in terms of those who disagree and those who agree and the difference is very very significant 80 percent plus indicating that they would want our ECOWAS leaders leaders from what the west africa sub region to desist from going ahead with that uh, intervention uh, it's the reason for which we're having this discussion because uh, ECOWAS says that it will fund the military action from their own resources resources which actually means that uh, in the coming days this will be done through the efforts of myself, yourself, the general public, because Ghana would also essentially uh, be contributing some troops to, to be a part of the ECOWAS uh, force. So we actually uh, hit the streets of Accra to find out what you've also been saying about this decision. We know that we are in deep crisis now, but the key point too is our brothers that need our aid. Uh -huh. So this is the, even though we are in crisis, a major crisis, uh -huh. it's our Ghanaian money though, but it's, it's, it's a humanitarian support that we are giving to them. Ask yourself, what is the main reason? What is going on there? You should know, you and I, we should know what is going on there. Because of bad governance. That is why those kind of things is going on there. Likewise, let's come back to Ghana. Look at what is going on. People stealing money, hiding those money in their homes. Bank of Ghana losing a whole lot of money. So whatever is happening in Niger, I do concord it. I do support it. But for government to waste money in deploying our military men to go there, I, I, I don't concord it. So they need something like that. They need our help to go and I mean, support them for them to stop fighting. Fighting is not good at all. Uh -huh. Niger need the word of God. Uh -huh. They lack so many things that we also have to support them to stop what they are doing.
Okay, um, so some Ghanaians there sharing their thoughts about uh, the uh, meeting which is underway and whether or not the countries uh, in ECOWAS should be deploying their troops. It's also got to do with capacity. So what's the capacity of the uh, military force uh, among some of the West African countries? My colleague uh, Isaac Ophiage is a uh, data analyst with the research desk here at Joy News. Uh, he's been uh, looking at the military options, the strengths of these uh, countries, there are 11 of them, as we understand, going into this joint operation. Let's start off with the military force. Uh, that, that we have. And after we do this, uh, we'll try and hear from some of our guests helping us with the discussion. Colonel uh, Festus Abaji is also on, and uh, we have Mukta Mumuni Mukta who will be joining us shortly. But, but I want us to understand the figures uh, involved here. What's the strength, and when we're talking about the strength of the forces, how is it looking like for countries such as Ghana and other uh, you know, West African uh, countries? So if you look at, on the whole, the West African sub region and you look at the military force, we are looking at somewhere around. 500,000 active troops. And we understand that Nigeria is more or less like the powerhouse of this um, you know, active military uh, personnel, um, having around more than two, uh, 200,000 active troops. If you look at Ghana, for instance, we are looking at somewhere around 16,000. Mm -hmm. Togo is having around 10,000, with other countries having around, you know, um, around 20,000, 20, 16,000. And, and in fact, the indication we're getting from the experts is that you need more than a, a 30,000 exactly. force to, to go and, in and, there. And, and uh, let's, let's do this. Let, let's hear from Kenel first as uh, Isaac, we'll get into the uh, data for you shortly. Uh, and Kenel, you've been monitoring the meeting um, that, that transpired earlier today. The indication we're getting, and you just heard from Ambassador Fatal uh, there, indicating that they will go in, certainly. As for the time, they will not disclose that. So the debate is over as to whether or not ECOWAS will go in. Well, thanks for having me once again. What the Ambassador Musa Fatal said makes sense. But they cannot disclose what I will call the D-Day, the day on which ECOWAS will initiate hostility. But the signals from ECOWAS clearly is that Equas is being more jingoistic. You see, more than emphasizing diplomacy. And when you ask him about diplomacy, or you ask Equas about diplomacy or the diplomats take option, it refers to uh, delegations that went there a week or two ago and were rebuffed. Is Equas playing a timeline on diplomacy that, in such instances, and in you know, cognizance of ECOWAS's own experiences. When you engage with somebody you are in dispute with, after 14 days, if you hadn't had a response, that is where you draw the line and say that, okay, the diplomatic option is out of the question. Because we all know that after uh, General Abdul Salam, former head of state, had been rebuffed, a delegation of clergy went there and they were received. We also know that a few days ago, the Prime Minister, newly appointed Prime Minister, went to Chad. And the Chadian leader had been the first to go to Niamey. Now, that is a track one diplomacy. The diplomacy that we're talking about is not only between ECOWAS and Niger. It is also about other key actors especially our neighboring countries like Chad and so on and so forth. And other civil society entities, former head of states and so on. That's track two. That is part of the diplomacy. So I have a bit of difficulty for anybody who suggests that after two weeks of engagement, if there hasn't been the desired uh, outcome from ECOWAS's perspective, that is the end of the diplomatic option. Now, what ECOWAS is doing is that ECOWAS has taken a position that we are coming to invade. Now, in conflict resolution, it doesn't work that way. So ECOWAS takes a position and trenches itself. Niger takes a position and trenches itself. And then you have a stalemate. So we are in a stalemate because sincerely, ECOWAS is not negotiating genuinely. And it's trying to place timelines and so on and so forth. And I think ECOWAS needs to tone down on what I had called earlier the Seba rattling, and try and emphasize more of the diplomacy, you see. But it's understandable, in Ambassador Musa Fatal's own words, 
That is part of the strategy of the strategic ambiguity, as he calls it. But leaning too much towards that extreme end of the use of force might not help in the long run. Of course, we should all know, and ECOWAS knows, the military chiefs know, that this is not a game of prophecy. It's not a game of prediction. It's a game of analysis. And this intervention could go either way. So you cannot even say that there is a 50-50 chance that ECOWAS is going to have the upper hand. So the statements like we have information that Niger is divided and so on, it's all propaganda. You see what I mean? Sincerely, if it has information, what are the sources? Now the ambassador is saying that the AUP and Security Council has not issued a communique and that it is fake news that the PSC does not endorse the ECOWAS position. The question is, Please, why yeah. has the PSC since the AUP and Security Council, mm -hmm. since it met last month, today is Thursday, it's not the norm that after a meeting that takes place on Monday, by Thursday there hasn't been a communique. Because it's not fake news. We also have contacts at the AU and in Addis Ababa. And yeah, but, but his point is that, that he was in that very meeting. You heard him say that, that he was present at, at yeah, that meeting. But he's telling one side, he's telling one side of the story. Mm. The other side of the story is that the PSC is a continental body. Granted that ECOWAS has more seas because we have many more member states, that is the 15, than other regions. But regionally or sub-regionally speaking, the three of the five sub-regions of Africa are not in favor of the intervention. The Maghreb, North Africa, is not in favor. Eastern Africa is not in favor. And in fact, Central Africa is not in favor. And SADC is not in favor. So ECOWAS diplomatically is isolated. This is an ECOWAS operation, yes, but ECOWAS is now embarking on a coalition course with the rest of Africa. And in due course, ECOWAS might have to pay the, the a price. Argument, the so argument, the argument, yeah, yeah, and, and Kenno, let, let me just bring that to your notice. The argument from uh, Ambassador Fatal uh, Abdel is that they, they do not need the express permission of any other um, you know, continental body or the United Nations Security Council to go into Niger. That, that's his argument. We're, we're a group of sovereign states um, you know, assessing the risk and the immediate threats in our own sub-region. There are two things that we're talking about here. We're talking about leg legality yeah. and legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Now, international uh, political support for any multilateral intervention or project is key. It's one of the success factors. So if you're going to go to Niger as ECOWAS, and you don't have the international public support, political support behind you, it's not, it's not sufficient. You refer to UN Security Council and say, oh, we don't need, uh, we don't need their express permission, we don't mm -hmm. need the express permission of the AU. Yeah. If that be the case, why did ECOWAS in that communique of 10th August requested, why did it request, sorry, yeah. the, the endorsement? What is the meaning of the English word endorsement? You see what I mean? Is it that they should take note of? They should have said so. And indeed, this, this diplomatic expression, take note of, and substantively endorse, was a bone of contention at the PSC uh, meeting where they wanted to take note of. And Akua said, no, it's not enough. We want you to be fair that you endorse. So you see, what he's telling us is part of the politics of Equus. But I'm saying that even if we are not in the PSC council in Addis Ababa, there are sources who also disseminate information. Right. I may very well have obtained my information from a SADC, you know, a diplomat or yes. from anywhere. But the truth of the matter is that ECOWAS is diplomatically, politically okay. isolated. isolated. I, see. I get that point. And now, that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so, yeah, so, so, so moving on, we know, and, and they are emphatic now that they will move in. W what are your fears about the possible implications for the Sahara region? We need, we need to go back. 
to the statement that he keeps making strategic ambiguity because if ECOWAS is to stop like this meeting if the meeting had not come on and ECOWAS had gone silent about any intervention then that gives the upper hand to Niger the point I'm making is that ECOWAS needs to find a fine balance between leaning too much on the jingoism angle and something on the other side of diplomacy. That is a balance ECOWAS needs to make. Now, as to whether it should go in or it can go in or not go in, after this planning, that is one of the stages, right? Mm -hmm. Any plan is on paper. Now countries need to go home. Assuming Ghana has pledged whatever it is, Ghana needs to go home and find out where it is going to get the men and the women, the armored cars, assuming there are fighters, planes, and so on, or support helicopters and so on, assuming our ships are going to play a role, for instance, yeah. our artillery, our engineers, mm -hmm. our communicate. Now we need to find these resources. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a chess board game. That you're going to take something from the Boku conflict, you might take something maybe from Operation Calm Life, you might take it from anywhere. Some money, the operational budget, we know that we are broke, but you can cut from here and there. My sense is that there is nowhere to cut because this government has virtually collateralized almost every revenue stream. Now, if you are collateralized, then you don't have the option of taking a bit from GetFund, from ESLA, from wherever. We owe school feeding program, don't we? Yeah, we do. So what about, uh, yes, we are in areas of the common fund and so on and so forth. So even me not being an economic, economist, I'm finding it difficult to find out or determine where the government is going to find the money. Mm. Let's remember that. Per the ECOWAS arrangement, which is part of the African Standby Force mechanism, each country going into this operation must be able to subsist on its own for 90 days. So if we are going, Ghana must fund its intervention for 90 days, or if you like, maybe 30 days, between 30 and 90 days. And then ECOWAS will reimburse. Now, they're not going to write other agreements that are not on the table. There has to be a contribution agreement between ECOWAS and each member state, stating the commitments on both sides. You see what I mean? Without those agreements, yes, there has been a communique, there has been a plan, but the member states will not okay. move their troops. Yeah, here's it's what... part of the bigger picture. Yes, mm. please. Uh, and here's what I, I want us to, to wrap up our conversation with. Uh, the, the point about Ghana and, and our mm -hmm. decision to contribute. The defense minister says that regardless of the disagreements among the rank and file of the military, they must remain, quote, loyal. That, that, I mean, th those were his words. He's asking all, all the military chiefs to be loyal to ECOWAS and to the state. Are we like is it are we getting a sense from that statement that, that there's some sort of division or maybe um unpopularity if i could use that word amongst the rank and file of the military about this decision before i answer may i ask you did yeah. the minister really say that there are some divisions or reservations or whatever within the armed forces so did his point is that? you must remain loyal regardless just remain loyal to ECOWAS yeah. in spite of your opinion on, on the matter yes but if you now stretch that statement to mean that there are divisions, I think that is not the way to think about it. Indeed, there are mechanisms within the armed forces to gauge the mood of the troops, the morale of the troops. As we speak, the high command knows what the mood of the soldiers are. So let's assume that a significant majority will not say we oppose it or we are in favor, but being soldiers, they will go along with the government decision. You see what I mean? Now, one reason why I think, and I said government must think twice, is that I have introduced the element of just cause. You cannot have a decision taken by ECOWAS, of which four of the decision makers are clearly non-democrats who have violated the same principles that ECOWAS is now standing on to go to Niger. So, 
you know, I beg to differ. Unless a court says that, yes, this is a watershed period, and after Niger, any country whose leader, civilian, military, otherwise, violates the ECOWAS uh, supplementary protocol on governance and democracy or democracy mm. and governance, we will go and intervene. Now I'm saying that is that a practicable strategic approach? Right. Because Niger is in all likelihood, it's not going to be the last. And indeed, if we're going to go on that tangent, within the last 10 years or so, we would have mounted about 14 interventions in African member states, including the four whose leaders are now saying that they support the intervention. And I want to mention the names. It includes Watara. And it, it includes, nya, nya, what do you call it? Yes. 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 And it includes Atanase, Talon, in, in, uh, in Benin. You see, so the, the whole idea is that there is a club mentality that when you touch civilian leaders, you have, you know, you have committed a taboo. It's an abomination. But when these civilian leaders misbehave themselves, and they misgovern, and mismanage, and they corrupt, and I've been asking, why are we not talking about right. the fundamental reasons? There are corruption elements in there. There are civil military relations elements in there, right? There are security management issues right. there. So governance is not about four-year cycle elections. There are many, many nitty-gritty things. Mm. So we should not get away with that, okay, we'll have the chance to go and vote every four years, and then after that is business as usual. That is not the idea. That's not the concept of, corrupt, right. uh, what do you call it, democracy. I see. And now, first, the you retired. We're grateful uh, that you're spending some time with us uh, this afternoon. The story is just unfolding. You. We'll definitely uh, get more updates. Isaac Kofi AJ is still with us here in the studio. Uh, Mukhtar Mumuni Mukhtar is also joining us uh, shortly uh, to comment on the data that we've been looking at. And Isaac, you just started about um, the numbers. Mm. And, and you were, you know, comparing some of the countries. For instance, we, we could look at Ghana, for instance, because that's our main concern here well, well, in the country. I, I think what's actually on the table right mm -hmm. now is the financial muscle to carry out this military operation or to stage this yeah. intervention. And ECOWAS themselves, they've been speaking to the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm. And since 2020, they've yeah. always wanted to set up this um, ECOWAS standby force mm -hmm with thousands of troops, but they've been set, there's been setbacks uh, just because of funding and also, um, you know, um, um, insufficient troops con commitment. Yeah. So since 2020, mm -hmm. they've had this, you know, um, issue that they had to battle with, but they, they finally settled on two options that they are looking at uh, in terms of how they are going to deploy uh, and, and what will be the budget involved. Okay. The so first one yes, is that, the numbers. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, they, they probably will set up a brigade of 5,000 troops. 5,000? 5,000. 5,000, okay. An annual cost of $2.3 billion annually. ECOWAS is going to establish a brigade and that will cost the, you know, the, the sub-region two points. Uh, and, for, and for those of you watching us, that, that, that's a, the, I mean, summary on the exactly, screens for you. Exactly. That's, that's so so five, a brigade of 5,000 mm -hmm. troops at a cost of $2.3 US dollars. Annually, yeah. We need that 2.3 plus for, our for, for economic stabilization. We, we ourselves <laughs> we need such money. And the second option is yeah. that they will probably set up, you know, uh, on-demand mm -hmm. uh, troops uh, that will cost them around $360 million. Okay, so this could be the buffer. Exactly. Right. So we have a feeling or per the information we are gathering, it looks as if this is actually the budget that ECOWAS can actually afford because at, at this point you can't go and say i am setting up a brigade yeah. to train people you need uh, the troops on demand so that will cost you an estimated at least 360, 360 million us dollars and, and and let's do some some quick math okay so 360 million that means US every month you'll be mm -hmm. spending 30 million dollars yeah Every week you'll be spending seven point five million dollars, mm. and every day that will cost you one point one million dollars. Echo, as they say, there's no superpower involved in this. Mm. We are going to fund this by ourselves. ourselves. And and the cost of a, a, a ticket to just fly over to Niger yeah. will cost way yeah. less. Yeah, yeah. way so, less. So, I guess zero point one percent of that budget. Absolutely, even less. Absolutely, and yeah. even feeding the troops mm -hmm. and probably other accoutre accoutrement that you have to buy the. You know, that will be significant. That will be very significant. So at this point, 
ECOWAS will have to weigh the options. Mm -hmm. You know, you have two options on the table. One is, do you still go on with your diplomatic, you know, engagement and probably set up that your 5,000 brigade and later on use it to, to serve as a deterrent mm. to, add, uh, you know, other yeah. people who would want to take over civilian yeah. government or you want to go and use your own... 2.3 billion uh, dollars. Yeah, yeah. But I, I also want us to look at domestically, mm -hmm. Ghana, do yes, we have that, our situation. Mm -hmm. Do we have that financial muscle to, mm -hmm. to actually participate in this? So we are looking at the uh, defense ministry's budget for 2023. It's somewhere around 3.7 uh, billion Ghana cities. Mm -hmm. And that 3.7 billion Ghana cities, if we do some you know, quick conversion, that's around $380 million. That's so we'll just be spending... Uh, that on the troops on demand it does not even cater that for, the, for the main for the entire <laughs> defense ministry or for the country's defense. so if you take that away it's gone in fact the point i'm trying to make is that 350 million dollars yes. in terms of defense is is, is it's a paltry figure exactly nothing to it's, write. It's, it's something very small and okay. if you look at the amount that we are spending on defense adv advisory for 2023 that's 10 million uh, ghana cities one million dollar for defense advice oh, okay i almost said we could there's a place we could find that amount easily right we, we know where to find one million dollars of course Absolutely. anyway that's that's just by the way uh, Mukta Mumuni Mukta is joining us uh, via zoom uh, Mukta, i mean the figures are staggering 2.3 billion dollars justified for who uh, the reinstatement of president bazoom and, and that's by no means um, undermining ECOWAS, knowing that the, the region says it's being threatened by, by the growth in military coup d'etats but the amount involved, should, should, we, should we be worried about the cost? Well, um, I think our conversations around this issue has to go beyond just the uh, economic cost of it to us directly. It goes beyond just the economic cost to us. It has, you know, other implications in terms of livelihood, in terms of long-term and medium-term uh, security challenges for Nigeria and for the entire West African sub-region. Uh, if you notice, and I've just been listening to your analysts mention the, I mean, the various figures, uh, especially the defense budget of Ghana, uh, it's less than 25 percent of what is projected to be spent uh, on this uh, operation. And so that tells you the huge or significant economic cost it would be uh, to, to Ghana and to any other party that is involved in this operation. And, and I think that it's important that we look at the long-term consequences of it very often. Uh, when you deploy uh, military operations or security operations of this nature, there are several other outcomes, unintended outcomes, that would impact significantly on the cost, the economic impact, and other livelihoods. And there's something we call uh, mission creep. We haven't had, you know, anywhere in detail in terms of the operational objectives of this mission in Niger. They are talking about prevailing on the military leaders to install President Bazoum to take charge of the country. But what does that mean? Is that all there is to this operation? We haven't seen significantly, in specific terms, what are the objectives of it? So we know that when we accomplish that, we know that we have accomplished what we have we set out to do. Very often with that defined objective, there's a potential for what we call mission creep. The potential that you could stay far beyond what you originally intended to go in there to execute. And that would have huge consequences for the operation. I think that we need to be very, very uh, thorough in terms of the engagement, in terms of analysis for the implications of this operation. Other than that, uh, we may be uh, getting ahead of ourselves in authorizing a military mission in Niger. If you listen to what has happened since morning here in Bermaka, in Ghana, it appears that ECOWAS, you know, I mean, I can appreciate that it's a very difficult situation for ECOWAS. And because and it's because we have missed several opportunities in the past to put things right in dealing with security in the sub region. And so now is the next best time to deal with it. But we have to be careful about the way we do it. Because I sense that in the communication of ECOWAS, it appears that they are very determined to uh, use the military option in Niger instead of exploring all the other options that were talked about in terms of engagement, diplomacy, and all that. And I can hear the justification built around the idea that the military leaders had not been willing to engage. And we have seen, you know, in the last couple of weeks, some engagements have happened. The military leaders have engaged, you know, leaders from Nigeria, from Chad, and other places. And our own, you know, research here has indicated that 
the military leadership is interacting with other actors within the region. And so all these things show the possibility that the military leaders could be engaged outside of the military intervention that we seem to be obsessed with, you know, I mean, uh, by way of ECOWAS. Okay. Um, are, you, are you by that suggesting that, that we cannot fund this, we cannot sustain this? Well, I am not in a position to talk about the economic capacity of Ghana, but what we know publicly uh, is that we do not seem to be in the right position uh, to deal with this situation economically. We already have a very, very difficult economic situation. Uh, households are struggling, you know, businesses are struggling, young people in terms of unemployment, we are struggling to deal with this issue. And so uh, if you bring in an element, you know, of an operation that would commit us to some significant economic, you know, uh, you know, commitment, it would be huge on us. And I don't think that we will sustain it. And if you listen to the economists, they tell you that this is the worst we have been probably in a very long time, in about maybe half a century. We haven't been in this situation in terms of the difficulty that we are in. And so, if anything, we should be leading in terms of mobilizing regional support for deploying, you know, diplomatic options to show, you know, Ghana's diplomatic powers, non-military, you know, tools for negotiation and resolving this issue peacefully. If you notice, Ghana has been chosen for this meeting of military, you know, chiefs within the region. And is, you know, owing to the long-term stability and peaceful that Ghana enjoys. And so we should take the lead as a regional leader for peace and security and ensure that we do not, you know, get judged by generations later for any negative role in regional security. So I think that we have to be very cautious about the way we do this and buy enough time to look at all the other options uh, in engaging in, in this situation. Uh, I mean, the decision of Ghana to host this, what are the direct or remote impacts in terms of possibility um, on, on our country? Uh, because the feeling of some experts is by what we're doing, we're sending that signal that we're the forerunners when it comes to the military action. We have our citizens, nationals there in Niger. That's a, a security threat, isn't it? Yes, on one hand, uh, it gives us some prominence in terms of regional leadership in dealing with security in the region. And for that, I support that, that kind of initiative to take a leading role in dealing with security situation or problems within the South region. But we also have to look at the uh, implications it would have on us in long term, short term. Already, you are hearing people from Niger, Ghanaians based in Niger, talking about the fact that there's some kind of communication going on, going around within Niger, that if the if was authorizes military action, citizens are going to rise up against you know, uh, nationals from these countries that are part of the ECOWAS decision. And that directly puts our citizens in danger in Niger. And so that is a possibility, and that is, a, you know, a very, very real danger uh, to consider. Uh, the other part is, uh, no matter how it goes, whether we go ahead with the military action or we go with the diplomatic tools in terms of options, uh, it has, you know, both positive and negative consequences for us. So I think that in principle, I agree. I support the idea that Ghana should host this kind of engagement. But at the same time, we need to look at all the broader implications it has for all of us. And to, to be safe in terms of how we could play a very positive role in it, we need to be very exhaustive in terms of the diplomatic and non-military ways to deal with it. And I think that this engagement today, we should build on it in a much more positive way. I'm not comfortable with the way ECOWAS is speaking about it because it appears that they are staging a very belligerent, bellicose posture when it comes to the military option because the conversation seems to be more disproportionately focused on the military option. And you hear the spokesperson, you know, you hear Ambassador uh, Musa talk about this and he appears to be justifying the decision even before we arrive at that decision, saying that we do not need unanimous or unanimity in terms of going into Niger, military intervention. He talks about the fact that, in fact, he has declared that multilateralism is there. And so it doesn't matter how many people support this decision, it has to be done. And that is dangerous because we are running and getting ahead of ourselves in that decision. We, because the understanding in the beginning was that this engagement is a deliberation 
regarding what are the options, what are the implications, how do we go about it, should we go and should we not. But at the point, I mean at this point, if you are justifying military intervention, it appears that that decision has been made in the bedroom before, right. you know, coming out publicly well, okay. to talk about it. Uh, we'll leave it here for now. Grateful uh, for your time. Mukta Mouni Mukta with the West Africa Center for Counter Extremism joining us on this conversation. Isaac, we need to go. Um, any more figures to take a look at as we wrap up? Well, I'm just looking at uh, our budget in terms of defense for 20, no, next year, 2024. Uh, we actually anticipate that uh, our defense budget will rise by some 13%, so from the 3.74 billion CDs to 4.23 billion CDs. And if you look at the breakdown, the amount that we are spending uh, on headquarters and agencies is taking more than 90% of this amount. So there's little, uh, little actually for, for such operations. Uh, so I, keep, I still keep asking myself, do we have any monies elsewhere or do we have any resource elsewhere? Is there anyone going to fund this project or this intervention that we are going to have? Because I, I, I look at the cost and then it comes at a time where almost all West African countries are actually yeah, And struggling. take a look at that. Yeah. 3.74 mm -hmm. billion, that's for... That's for this year, mm -hmm. 3.74 billion CDs. And if you do the breakdown, um, headquarters and agencies will take around uh, 3.5 billion CDs. So if you pay salaries yeah. and you do other few things, the money is gone. You don't have any other money, you know, to for defense advisory services for the purchase of ammunition and all of those things. And kind of, first of all, I just said something that you need to gauge the morale in, you know, of the military personnel and, and, and sense if they are actually ready. Are, are they really ready for, for this action? We know, does this look like a peacekeeping mission? Because I, I, it seems there's a difference between what, we, what actually happened in other countries versus what is actually happening now. Because I have this data to blessed. So if you look at what happened in Mali in 2021, this is what ECOWAS did. They placed economic sanctions. Yes. So there was a ban on trade on goods except food and fuel medicines to, um, how do you call it, Mali. Yeah. They also cut off from uh, regional um, you know, financial markets. There was also, they were also suspended from ECOWAS. ECOWAS, yes. You know, constitutional rule. Mm -hmm. those and also so, we so know that the family members, the relatives, uh, exactly. I mean, they, they've isolated Niger. Niger and and, 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 and this, this, this is not the first time there's, there's been a coup uh, in West Africa. Right from 2020, we've had a series of coup. But I feel that ECOWAS wants to use the, this to, to stamp the authority and say enough is enough. You know, if you want to change government, you should do it the yeah. right way. It shouldn't be right. through military coup. And, and so I feel that's the reason why they still want to, 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 to use this um, as a means to tell anyone who would want to do it later on that, look, this is not an option. The only option uh, is to go through... Um, you know, a democratic I see that lo lots and lots of uh, international developments that we are monitoring here on the polls. Uh, still ahead, when we get back from the break, Russia, India and China are reaching out to Africa. They control over 40% of the world's population. But this week, they are set to reach out to the continent through uh, their initiative called the BRICS. We'll talk about it when we get back. Please stay.